This week is the English week, the fish and chips week. Uh, first lecture in this English week is Patrick Schumacher. Um, I think it's not necessary to introduce Patrick. Everyone knows him as a patient teacher, and brilliant intellectual, brilliant critic. Uh, he was actually the first he introduced a very special review technique in this school. He invited people from the AA and then they were talking about the computer programs all the time um, and which program the student should use in order to get some results. I was um, always thinking they should have <laughs> pushed the um, the other button, uh, the button which says erase the whole program. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, architecture was a promise. Now it's rather a um, selling, marketing tool of selling fancy objects. In this wall of super Officiality uh, and undermining the monocosolic, simplifying thinking patterns, uh, Patrick's book uh, break a, a hole, I think, disturbing the thinking that architecture cannot be focused on a concept. Uh, what we have to discuss is his favor for closed system. Closed system which are um, anchored in the 19th century as a message for also, also Torit and um, um, systems. Um, I think that we all know that in our complex society only complex solutions are necessary, not the simple one. Simple solutions are simple and old. Complex solutions, and Patrick is proposing complex solutions in many levels, complex solutions are not optimal, but they are new. Uh, Patrick told me that he invented a new uh, laptop, this one. He's not showing pictures, images, he's only reading his own quotes. Patrick. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, Wolf, for the nice introduction, and um, thank you for offering this platform and being part of this relatively decent lineup of speakers. Um, this, I will try to make this a kind of lecture, the early stages of this event, and then hope to slowly transform it into a kind of seminar. Hope that there's a discussion, some questions, and um, please be, uh, feel free to ask. I'll be very soft on you, and uh, try to respond and get into dialogue with you. So, the title of the lecture is The Societal Function of Architecture. It's the first time I'm speaking about this particular aspect of the theory of architectural appearances. I've only done a few lectures on the book anyway so far, and mostly supported by slides. So this is also a new experience, and that's why I feel more comfortable turning it into a seminar halfway through it. I'm not sure how much time there is overall. I thought about an hour and a half max. Uh, with hopefully a lot of discussion. So, the question, what is the societal function of architecture, is uh, I think a legitimate question. It's perhaps a necessary and important question. Important for the self-regulation and self-determination of the discipline. Um, which is the key aspect of the theory of architectural autopoiesis, that architecture is a 
self-regulating discourse with no authority over it, neither politicians nor clients being able to instruct what architecture is and how it responds to contemporary challenges. But this question um, has been, is rarely posed. Um, so perhaps it is assumed to be obvious, but is it obvious? So my first question to you is, uh, are there any answers here in the room? So uh, what is the societal function of architecture? What is the purpose of architecture? Any um, ideas, proposals? From the floor, we can enter the discussion right here. Um, intercept at any time. So, well, what are we doing as architects? We produce buildings. Um, what do buildings do? I mean, you could point to shelter, protection, keep us dry and warm. But is that what uh, requires a kind of academic discipline? Um, do we need kind of Wolf Briggs, Sardine, Draglin to do that? I doubt it. So, what do buildings do? Are we just doing buildings or perhaps we're doing beautiful buildings? So, is that what it is? Are we artists, therefore? Or are we doing particularly well-functioning buildings? Does that mean that we are engineers? Or are we just doing original buildings? Does that mean that architecture is a kind of um, an, end in, an end in itself, a kind of play, like perhaps Eisenman and Kippus sometimes assume? Um, but uh, that's not what I mean by the autonomy of architecture, which I'm defending. The autonomy is, um, which is the autopersis of architecture, is characterized through the formula openness through closure. So self-referential closure is just a means of being gearing up to have a more pertinent and well-considered response. That's why we need a kind of disciplinary closure to work out pertinent and sophisticated responses uh, without being pushed by clients or politicians. Um, Zaha is saying, for instance, architecture is about well-being is you know, more ambitious perhaps, and just keeping this dry and warm, or making something beautiful, but that's at the same time perhaps vague. Of course, you could also say perhaps medicine is about well-being, or if it's more you know, social well-being, the political system is, it might pose that as its purpose, perhaps in the legal system. So, uh, can we be more specific? And that's what I'm trying to elaborate this evening. Um, I think uh, another, I want to introduce an important distinction at this point also, which is the distinction between architecture and mere building. Architecture being kind of based on an academic theory led engagement and uh, innovative practice with forward drive. And building is just kind of keeping a tradition alive and, and uh, reproducing what has uh, survived the test of time, if you like. And that um, has been going on, that's been the way the built environment has been reproduced for thousands of years until the big bang of architecture in the Renaissance where we have a kind of theory-led practice with innovative forward drive, moving from the direct engagement with the build, building and construction into this kind of the domain of the paper, for the first time, we have fully designed architectures circulate just as um, speculative constructs on paper. But I'm stepping back because uh, what architecture delivers through a kind of paper discourse, through a theoretical discourse, in the final analysis, it's still tied to what the built environment does for society, and that has been a kind of a primordial. Con uh, contribution all the way through uh, history, not just starting with, let's say, a specific specialized discourse. So the societal function of the built environment, first of all, needs to be asked about, 
And uh, I would argue that this is a very, very deep kind of um, contribution, which but the built environment makes. It's a crucial factor, I would argue, in the Menschwerdung, in the emergence and becoming of mankind, in the construction ultimately of society, that means. And I want to um, elaborate this a little bit with a piece of reading from the manuscript. Um, that is the a small segment of volume two, which has been submitted to the publishers. So here the chapter I want to read is the built environment as indispensable substrate of societal evolution. So this, I'm raising the stakes a bit. In this way, so society uh, can only evolve with a simultaneous ordering and articulation of space. The elaboration of the built environment, however haphazard, precarious and based on accident rather than purpose and intention originally seems to be a necessary condition for the build-up of any stable social order. The gradual build-up of a social system must go hand in hand with the gradual build-up of an artificial spatial order. That's a statement which is simply covered by all of history of mankind. If you like. All societies are based on architectures. Social orders therefore require spatial order. The social process needs the built environment as a plane of inscription where it can leave traces that then serve to build up and stabilize social structures that in turn allow the further elaboration of more complex social processes. The importance here is a relative stability and cross-generational accumulation of structure and order in the built environment which is another kind of quasi-genetic substrate of the evolution on top of the genetic code, because without that we would just we stay in the animal kingdom, if you like. Um, so this, the evolution of society goes hand in hand with the, with the evolution of its habitat, understood as ordering frame, and that's an important category I'm introducing. The spatial order of the um, um, human habitat is both an immediate physical ordering apparatus that separates and connects social actors and the activities and, second important dimension of this, a mnemotechnic substrates for the inscription of social memory. These inscription might at first be an unintended side effect of the various activities which unfold and produce these environments. Then given spatial arrangements are functionally adapted and elaborated further, then they are further marked and underlined by ornaments which make them more conspicuous. Well, that's also important. It becomes a kind of um, quasi-memory, as I would call it. The result is a gradual build-up of a spatio-morphological system of signification. Thus emerges a semantically charged built environment that provides a differentiated system of settings that help social actors to orient themselves with respect to the different communicative situations that constitute the social life process of the community. I think it's important to point out here that this same deep role is not only played by the kind of elaborated and evolving physical environment, but also uh, everything which later on turns into what we now call all the design disciplines. So it is about uh, you know, dress codes, clothing, makeup, the, 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 the articulation of social persona and, and social distinctions through these means, as well as the artifactual and, uh, uh, world which continues the both hand have the kind of operational quality in sustaining life, but also picks up this kind of semantic dimension. So the system of social settings as a system of distinctions and relations uses both the positional identification of places, that means spatial position, 
and the morphological identification of places, in brackets, ornamental marking, as props for the social communication process. Indications for this formative nexus between uh, social and spatial structure bound within social anthropology, attesting to the crucial importance of stable spatial morphological settings for the initial emergence and stabilization of all societies. In the analysis of the social structure of primitive societies, the drawing of a village plan, for instance, often serves as the most succinct summary and point of reference. So that's the kind of, a lot of anthropology is focusing on, that's the raw material of anthropological <coughs> analysis, if you like. Um, settlement structures and, and, and the whole world of what, of what later on is called the arts and crafts and now it's called the design disciplines. So appropriately designed places regulate social communication by helping to define the situation, which is so important, reminding actors about who they are, ordering the actors into the appropriate relative positions through kind of configuration, like the space is configuring us, not only the space, but its furnishings as well. Um, so the semiological dimension of the built environment is already coming into play here as the built environment develops from the state of vernacular tradition to the state where it is advanced by the autopress of architecture, the task of conscious semiological articulation arises. So it has been always already operating, but and I think each sophisticated designer knows how to navigate this kind of these domains of signification intuitively. And if they can't get it right, the client will notch them on them that, to a certain extent, but it remains the responsibility of the, of the architectural discourse to, to elaborate this. But I think so far has not been made a conscious, or rarely and fragmentary only, made a conscious um, dimension of upgrading architectures, expertise as, a, as an intellectual project. So the importance of the spatial morphological setting as defining um, and framing of defining frame for social communication has also been recognized within sociology and social psychology. Uh, Irving Joffman, for instance, um, was very much aware of the need for frames and assemblages of sign equipment, as he calls it, that structure social communication. So I'm quoting Joffman here, first there is a setting involving furniture, decor, physical layout and other background items which supply the scenery and stage props for the uh, spate of human actors played out before, within or upon it. A setting, a setting uh, tends to stay put, geographically speaking, so that those who would use a particular setting are part, uh, as part of their performance cannot begin their act until they have brought themselves to the appropriate place and must terminate their performance when they leave it. And that goes for every single <laughs> communicative interaction. And my whole theory is based on communication theory and architecture takes a universal claim for structuring frames for communicative interaction, which is the kind of communication which operates between people present to each other. And this kind of interaction is never in any, it's always structured. A system of places, spatial frames, as well as, you know, clothing, fashion systems, artifacts, props. We never, we rarely communicate out naked in the wilderness, do we? Um, I think that is critical. And I sometimes have this thought experiment to understand what this total apparatus, this giant sorting and communication machine of the city produces, and how it sustains a complex social communication process, just have to imagine a kind of large city like Vienna you know, or London to be raised and you roll out a kind of empty tarmac field and have naked body, the one million naked bodies kind of trying to understand who they are, who to gather with, what to do next. I mean you know that there's, there's an enormous amount of uh, embedded and accumulated intelligence and information processing within there. Uh, and when we kind of are relatively simple 
response mechanisms and we are kind of jerking through and, and retrieving information embedded in these rich uh, layered and sedimented information structures. It's a bit reminded by um, Herbert Simon who says the kind of complexity of the jittery and complex path of the end is in the environment and not in the end, which is a very simple uh, algorithm. And we are slightly more complex, but still, I'm telling you, I see this, that the complexity of social processes is in the built environment to a large extent. Um, and that's what we're working on and elaborating further into the future. Um, where was I? So, the built environment remains a powerful tool of organization, sorting and ordering people and their activities. It is important to grasp that the ongoing, uh, the, sorry, the ordering capacity of spatial arrangements and the specific order provided is not an independent objective property of the respective built spatial arrangements, but crystallizes only in the pattern of utilization that it catalyzes. So there is a kind of dialectic operating. Complexity is always in the interaction. And that's where you can also reutilize and reinscribe meanings into all the sedimented structures. But there's always a, this is always a relatively small process, slow process. There's a lot of redundancy and some degree of mutation, selection of further reproduction innovation. The built environment, plus some more mobile artifacts like furnishings, tools, clothes, etc., together engage in an inextricable metabolism or ecology, which is, according to the theory of architectural apiosis, at first is best described as a system of communications. As the built environment develops from the state of vernacular tradition, that brings back the distinction between architecture and building, to the state of architecture, the task of conscious semiological articulation arises. Architectural settings are to be designed as framing communications, as permanent broadcasts that function as constraining and enabling premises for all further communications as are to be expected within the respective spaces and settings. Architectural settings are communications that help to define and structure social institutions. So, and each setting is in fact operating as a communication is also attributed to somebody communicating. So all the spaces here are attributed in this case to the to an institution like the Angewandte. So they have the full recognition of, of that communication because all spaces are attributed, not necessarily to the designer, but to the host who is offering and utilizing uh, the setting to stage its social communication events. Um, at that point, I, I'm not f finished, but we could intercept. Is there any questions at that stage? Queries, challenges? Uh, you describe sort of intelligence to this buildup of description and continuity in that system? Uh, yes. Okay. Would you describe that intelligence? Because you describe it as sort of active or sort of ordering and sorting. Is that an invisible hand? Is it, is, or is, where does that intelligence come from? Of this ordering and sorting? Is that us? That's more a kind of the way our language is. Uh, has to express everything through verbs. Right? I think that what it is, 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 is definitely uh, um, a, a uh, constraining and cajoling and also um, triggering substratum, which, which becomes active, of course, in the way we rely on it and engage with it and are responding to it and have been conditioned to respond, to remember and recognize. So the active part, ultimately, if you like, is, is perhaps in the in the um, in the individuals navigating this. But that would also be. I would be cautious to say that. I think ultimately the the, the active part, the, the part which is uh, which evolves and has history, is the social what they call the social communication system, um, in which each of individual reaction responses conditionings <coughs> to otherwise inert, yes, admittedly inert, obviously, environments, uh, is structured. So, I don't know if that answers the question, but the, uh, I think, um, so, 
the verbal, that they have to express this through verbs, gives it the sense that there's a kind of active, active force, but it's only in the dialectic um, with, um, with the um, evolving uh, social system that, is, that you can attribute uh, this kind of ordering capacity to it. Also comparing this with the absence of such an ordering substratum or compared with the different, um, maybe more simple structures, you see that the capacity of the overall system, which is always embedded within the such complexly evolved environments, then you can attribute the capacity to it. Then you say, here is a kind of an, at least an indispensable ingredient to the social order which emerges and can only emerge on the back of it, through it, as a kind of cross-generationally cross uh, sedimented, call it evolutionary substrate. Um, so I think you're a bit uh, hooked. Don't let yourself be tripped over by a kind of, let's say, linguistic structure of these sentences, if you like. Social system and social system theory is a kind of uh, emergent phenomenon, autocratic phenomenon. So, even so, the category of communication system is extremely broad, as is the category of communication. So, I will ever this for a bit. Communication is: I poke you, I just look at you a bit harshly, I say something to you, I pay you. Uh, something, um, I ignore you, I, is also a communication. Uh, but also the space of the Z is, is, is a communication because it, um, it frames as a kind of a premise, a law, which is hovering in the back of the minds and we know about, is a communication. So communication is very, very broad and the communication system is a very, very broad category, which includes long-standing, over century evolving discourses, there, which build their category structures, semantic structures and so on. But also an event like this one here is an autopoetic social system in the following sense. I mean it's pre-structured by the architecture, by an announcement, so on. But still there's a certain it, it, it develops a certain uniqueness that meaning in our interaction in my presentation we kind of uh, forging uh, sharing a short history and uh, we are establishing terms amongst ourselves, a certain demeanor, certain terms, so that and we're starting to enclose ourselves. And that is a kind of autopoetic, autopoetic means also self-enclosure, self-referentially enclosed, where a newcomer suddenly feels that he's not part of that, finds it difficult to catch on. Uh, so we, and we also expel intruders quite soon, and even in a party where people are gathering and there's a little group forming, this, these are autopoetic systems. system, I mean they're self-ordering their terms of reference, their structure, who is in, who is out, the demarcation of the system. So it is very, very broad, you're 100% right. I'm not privileged in architecture, uh, but architecture is uh, one of, uh, there are various types of social systems. So there's ephemeral events, there are formal organizations, like a university or a firm, a company, and they also, you know, they, they have their own kind of rituals and, and demarcation lines. They know who is in, who is out, what comments are belonging to the discourse of the, the company and which ones are kind of private conversations. Uh, but there is one cat very important category of social communication systems, uh, which Newman has identified. He calls it the great function systems of society. And these and society, where you find these great function systems, the so-called functional differentialist society, and 
can say architecture is one of those, like the political system, like the legal system, like the economic system, like the mass media system. These are kind of special types of function systems which have a, a few hundred years of history, all of them. They've developed specific discourse, categories, values, methods, great texts as focal points of uh, structuring this. And that's what the book is about. It, it uh, looks at the auto process of architecture as this 500 year old, elaborate, intelligent structure, which at the same time needs, needs continuously updating. And it's one of the great function systems of society. And with respect to function systems, you can ask the question, what is the societal function? You can ask, what is the societal function of the political system? What is the societal function of the legal system? And as far as Luhmann is concerned, each of these has a unique societal function addressing a unique problematic or exigency which all societies have to face. And, um, I have time, been trying to identify what is this societal function which of the built environment first of all, but then in the next stage of a particularly self referentially closed specialist discourse, which is architecture, who's taken up what I call universal uh, and exclusive claim of competency for the totality of the built environment and the totality of the artifactual world to include the design disciplines. And uh, there is the societal function for each system which acts as an evolutionary attractor to forge this kind of self referential closed system specialized to deliver this function. So all social systems are to, to wrap this up are autobiotic systems, but there are some very powerful, important subsystems of contemporary or modern society, great function systems. Um, yeah. I have a question now. Uh, uh, you need more, more specific about this, uh, this evolution of the system you are referring to? Yeah. Well, this, the book describes some of that. So, the distinction between architecture and building is important. So, I was, before architecture arrives, the villagers built their structures themselves as they've always been, as minute, basically trying to repeat what has been done, maybe integrating small improvements as they see fit, and that maybe is then tr traded on. And you have certain structures emerging, really like um, self-organizing uh, morphogenic processes. For instance, the way villages usually take a kind of near, near circular shape. Uh, they like to create a kind of boundary of wall, a lot of walled cities emerging in walled villages. And some of the, the way these emerge have to do with kind of local rules, uh, developing global orders. They're not consciously planned. They're kind of through an evolutionary process of trial and error uh, generate a certain rationality. For instance, a village which was an extremely long that kind of stretched piece would be very vulnerable, the wall wouldn't stand up, would be, would, you know, the internal communication would be inefficient, there's a lot of inefficiency. So it's nearly like the cell as a kind of circular system, the, the village form as a circle, city as a circle. It builds actually in concentric circles upon circles, that's recognition of its growth. All of this is totally unconscious and it is reproduced by myopic repetition of what has always been done. And that's what I call building. And at a certain point in history, there's this kind of big bang, which is the arrival of architecture, where in a sudden this has been looked at. It is actually, the main important thing here is that it's drawn and immediately becomes a point of discourse, criticism, and innovation. You have the ideal city, the Renaissance, which when you look at it closer, it's just the kind of rationalization and geometrization of what has evolved as a medieval city anyway. It's not, the innovation is kind of not that large. But once you've drawn it out onto the kind of domain of speculation, the paper domain, 
and you start to write about it, talk about it, ask questions about it, make and, and also innovate and you want to you want to um, propose innovations, you gotta kind of you have a discourse and you have a huge acceleration of the evolution. And that's the kind of ultimate raison d'etre of each of these specialized intellectual enterprises which you know architecture has become, but the same as a political system. You know, you have an, a nearly spontaneously emerging political orders uh, when, when small clans gather into tribes, they discover ways of uh, uh, operating together. Uh, it's actually a lot of this kind of uh, rather democratic in the early stages, that's why it's early police democracy also. And as they continue and evolve, at a certain stage, at the same time, again, in the Renaissance, also to do with the rediscovery of the classics, you have political criticism, political theory, ideas that become the project of you know, political construction. And, there's, and so these are the, the, the moments where these function systems are born with discourses, with theory, with speculation, uh, with self-consciousness and the self-referential closure as discourses. They all uh, then become subsystems of a larger society which suddenly has this enormous accelerator. I mean, this acceleration um, and the build-up of complexity is possible through this, what well, then becomes a functional differentiation. But before, everything was much more fused. It was the religious leadership was at the same time, the political leadership was at the same time, the economic power was at the same time those who determine the built environment, who were also controlling knowledge. And these kind of things splinter into, you know, it's an evolutionary process, into uh, domains of special, uh, specially competent and separated self organized systems, like science is one of them. So instead of relying on the, the top of the stratified order to be in charge of religion, economy, political power, knowledge, you have these discourses separating out and co-evolving without any controlling center. And that's the situation there. We are in a kind of uh, stage of societal development where you have a series of parallel, a network of parallelly co-evolving, self-referentially closed societal subsystems, which at the same time have the obligation and necessity to continuously observe what's going on around and adapt themselves to stay relevant, to stay on course, and that's never guaranteed. And architecture has gone through a number of crises where, they, where this expert discourse made itself nearly irrelevant. It had to be nearly built, rebuilt from scratch by matrics, by new starters, by Prince of the Pioneers of the modern movement. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> how these, how these uh, contemporary uh, subsystems of society, which are called the great function systems of society, have, have evolved <laughs> out of initially undifferentiated, uh, tradition-bound um, cultural evolutions, uh, which didn't have, which, which were more kind of happening as it was going on, without much foresight, without much critique, without much reflection. But what what happened since, and this book is kind of an, an, another level and loop in this, that the necessity to to step out and build up layers of reflection in what I call the great self-description of these function systems is an important factor in the overall guidance of these disciplines because they do run into crises and, and that, that, that uh, engenders a kind of reassessment of the tasks, re-adaptation of the, of the pertinent ways forward and in my terms also the development of a new style which kind of programs and reprograms the disciplines forward, forward trajectory. Um, maybe at this stage I can move on to um, um, a note on what this, let's say, emphasis on architecture is, uh, is first of all the discourse of system communication, but also its product as framing communications delivered to all the other systems of communication which society consists on. So some kind of 
architecture that is delivered to us as this ephemeral event within the kind of organization. So this is a framing communication, as I said. Um, the core competency so I'm, uh, of architecture, you think about it this way, is therefore no longer, and for a long time no longer, uh, kind of the uh, technical competency of putting together a, a construction that is more and more taken up by engineering specialists, even to the point that now we can't even detail a facade or, uh, or anything at all. So we become these pure designers, and more and more the question becomes, what is our core competency? And in my terms, this is, is the, the competency of organization and articulation, which is then unfolded into uh, an expertise of uh, dealing with how things are perceived, comprehended, and that turns into a kind of a logical dimension and a semi-logical dimension. So in, in volume two, I'm emphasizing this project of the semi-logical project, and see there the kind of core competency once everything else has been more and more kind of drawn into an engineering competency. What's left for the architect? That was my question. And the other aspect is, part of that is, is, is the handling of what we call, call the aesthetic dimension of this. It's linked into this. And I want to maybe read a few um, remarks at this stage um, which help us to demarcate architecture from science and uh, science engineering on one hand and from art on the other hand and leads us to a discussion of um, aesthetic values and aesthetics and the constant category of beauty uh, and why that is so relevant and we keep obsessing about it, whether we admit it or not. It takes up 80% of our work. Um, so I'm going to read this text. So the thesis here um, is that design is neither art nor science. It is a sui generous competency. In distinction to engineering, architecture and design, and I put these two together, they together form the greater function system of design special architecture. So um, in distinction to engineering, architecture and design takes the users of architecture into account as socialized sentient beings. That's the kind of Critical point, engineers never do that. Uh, and only if you do that, you know that you're hitting the core competency of architecture, I would argue. It has to be recognized that built environments function via perception and comprehension. This poses the task of articulation. Organization and articulation, these are the key categories which, in a sense, take the societal function of architecture and make it concrete as the task of architecture. Organization and articulation. And these together establish order. So I'm kind of calibrating a set of terms. And architectural order emerges through the components of organization and articulation as the two irreducible constituent components of architecture's task. Organization is concerned with physical distancing, separation, and connection of domains, and is thus framing communication physically by physically channel channeling movement and interaction. Articulation is concerned with orientation and is framing communication cognitively. Articulation is guiding movement and interaction via conspicuity and atmospheres, via perceptual as well as semiotic clues. Organization recognizes and operates via social communications, dependency on human beings as mo mobile bodies in space. Another contrast. While articulation recognizes and operates via social communications dependency on human beings as perceiving comprehending subjects. You can see in this kind of formulation that what really counts is the social system. And we as kind of human beings are kind of launched within that, but as a, an organization picks us up as bodies and articulation picks us up as um, perceiving comprehending subjects. So architectural order involves the task dimensions of organization and articulation, the latter comprising phenomenological and semi-logical articulation. The unique expertise or core competency of architecture is therefore the establishment of order, the organizing and making legible of social relations, the framing, that is the structuring and priming of social communication interactions. And by priming, is, is this really important to see 
what the, the, to see the definition of a communicative situation as a fundamental problem. If you have um, an encounter and it's not kind of pre-structured and framed by a setting, and you're very unsure and uncertain what to expect, and you're waiting for the other to define what this is about, what's going on here, uh, then, you, then that you, communication will not take place. The situation is blocked. So you need to always, there needs to be a kind of structure, in particular the more people are involved, there needs to be a kind of structuring institution, which needs to pre-structure, prime as it were, and pre-order and premise the unfolding event, otherwise there will no meaningful event will take. Um, and this kind of moment of ambiguity and uncertainty, you could call the double contingency of any encounter because A is waiting for B to kind of make a move and B is waiting for A and they don't know what to expect. That's a kind of a, a blockage and anything could happen, that means nothing could happen. That's a kind of a very deep sociological level the way you can kind of uh, describe what architecture does on that kind of micro level. It, it defines situations, which there's a whole sociology as a sociology of defining situations. Uh, and to see that as a problem. So, let me go back. So, um, spatial framing supports the ordering and temporary stabilization of patterns of communication. I mean, te historically temporary. I mean, as society evolves, the institutions evolve. It needs to be continuously upgraded and updated and more and more complex framing settings which can allow society to become ever more complex, more productive. And that's a function of its complexity. Now we're living in a global, multicultural society where we're communicating in, in intensive relationships all the time with many people, some of you like. And occasions like this where we, set, we constantly gather in a concentrated interaction that's becoming more and more rare. Uh, so this has to be taken into account. So that is, these are kind of temporary stabilizations, uh, historically temporary, but um, local time periods, uh, it's all about stabilization. So these spatial framings are permanent broadcasts that operate at antecedents or premises of all communication interactions to be expected within the bounds of the respective frame, be it a single space, a building, or an urban territory. So it's not only the individual space, which is of importance, but where the space is located in the total matrix of spaces. It's not only you to know what to do, what to expect. So you dress up for an occasion, you go into a certain setting, but also to find pertinent and meaningful partners of communication. They can only find each other through that kind of ordered matrix of spaces. Um, So, there's a thesis um, formulating again, all social communication requires institutions. And some of the institutions that I know uh, um, are family event structures, and very, very rarely you have a kind of, you kind of thrown out into an absurd, strange situation uh, with, with a stranger you're stranded somewhere, in, I don't know, in, in the Himalayas, then you might be able to, you might invent your own little communicative autocratic structure. You, you will invent your own institution, but you might still re have, rely on um, known institutions. So all institutions, all in communication are based on institutions. All institutions require architectural frames. The societal function of architecture is therefore, that's my formula, to order society by the continuous provision and innovation of the built environment as a system of frames. And the point of innovation is very important, I mean, because this is that's why architecture had to separate out as an academic, intellectually uh, self-critical discipline with forward drive, because we have to continuously upgrade and update and further adapt and evolve these architectural frames. If we had a very, very stable society, like feudal era, which was for a thousand years, nothing much happened, you don't need architecture and a specialized discourse. You just had, was fine with building, you didn't have to think. It was just reproduced itself. Point is that architecture is this kind of conscious, self-critical, and that's what you know, you continuously look what anybody else in the world is doing, you're trying to update, to pick up, to criticize each other, uh, you know, to challenge each other. That's the kind of uh, modern 
functions is what they like. Uh, backed up this theory with, 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 this, with, with structures like the avant garde versus mainstream, where the avant garde can really intensify the discourse and speculation. But ultimately, the underlying Accentuality is still this kind of ordering and reordering in an updated way social communication through the provision of spatial frames. So um, I was talking about organization and articulation. So Bill Hillier, this quite interesting space syntax, offers a science inverted commas of organization, or he calls it a science of configuration. My question is then: Can there be a science of phenomenological and semiological articulation? I mean, that's all about upgrading the discipline. We know all this, we work intuitively, can we make this a kind of self-critical, innovative uh, upgrading of our intelligence? So I think this can and should happen on all three dimensions of architecture's task. We need to upgrade our organizational capacities, our phenomenological intelligence, and our semiological expertise. And that's what I've been trying to do in the class here, I'm just starting to develop a kind of semiological project and the theoretical underpinnings of that. Uh, but our intuitions remain a control device here because to a certain extent we know already how to navigate this complex system of unification. We have that training, that gut sensibility, <laughs> that talent hopefully to do that. And if you, if you blunder in this respect, you will not flourish. So those who flourish, they are very kind of attuned to the requirements on that semiological dimension. Whether they know it, they will be able to reflect and discuss it or not. So yes, I think there can be and must be a science-informed normative theory of these dimensions. But, that's important, design is not a science. Organizationally, phenomenologically and semiologically informed design is a different practice from scientific practice. I'm not turning architecture into science. It can't be done. So, the double code and that's a bit of theory I bring in. The double code of utility and beauty that governs design is very different from the code of scientific truths of probability. The reason for this difference, why can't it be a science, is that designers need to act and decide quickly in the face of uncertainty and incomplete information. Science, in contrast, never reaches closure. It has infinite time and patience to follow through the ramifications of hypothetical constructions, for instance. And in the science, the refutation is as much valued as a positive theoretical proposal. And what the science are also have the luxury to do, they just work on the things they have the tools to solve. And work on this. Because society is not posing questions to them, they work on questions they know how to answer, have a glimpse of what. And we as designers are throwing the deep end, we have to react whether we have knowledge, expertise or not. We just come up with stuff. Now in the avant-garde it's a little bit more interesting and different. In the avant-garde we have a chance to step back and formulate our own problematics. But they need to be pertinent to what the real designers out there are thrown in at the deep end. To a certain extent, science also is looking indirectly, remotely at what society requires. If not, these discourses would be, can become kind of irrelevant. But still, there remains a very, very fundamental difference between the kind of necessity to quickly decide in the absence of a fully resolved theory or, or assessment of the situation. And that's why aesthetic values must come into play. They are kind of, they have to do with this necessity to act intuitively. And this intuition has to have a sense of, have at least the broad direction right. And uh, that, I think, is the role of aesthetic values, to deliver that. Uh, aesthetic values, to the extent that they are historically well adapted, and that's an important caveat, facilitate quick, intuitive decision making, both for designers making design decisions and, also importantly, for users making decisions about which space to enter. The recognition of the beautiful is the instant perceptual recognition of the vital, the function identified on the basis of its mere appearance prior to a more inverse experience and verification of the entity's functionality. We all act intuitively all the time. Who we go, you know, who we approach in the top of the fashion system helps us to decide that. And, and 
which places to go to navigate aesthetically, of course. Therefore, the category of beauty cannot simply be opposed to rationality. Being attracted to beauty is not per se irrational. The discrimination of beauty versus ugly is a culturally defined instantiation of the fundamental biological mechanism of attraction and repulsion. Organisms are attracted to what serves their survival and reproduction and repulsed by what impairs their survival and reproduction. Aesthetic sensibility is a constant universal feature of all human behavior and action. So it's very, very deeply rooted and anthropological kind of constant. Uh, um, and there's a deep rationality to that. So some of its aspects, even, I would argue, might be hardwired by biological evolution. And I believe that the kind of an, an attraction to order and a rejection of chaos might be one of those. Others aspects are culturally evolved and imparted, yet other aspects might be based on individual conditioning. So we also have an idiosyncrasy of what we like. But one thing is important, uh, in a fast evolving society, which changes its patterns of communication and what it demands for each individual, you have to continuously relearn and adapt and develop your aesthetic sensibilities and also your moral sensibilities. You can't just, um, you might have the wrong sensibilities, which prevent you from entering the most vital and active and productive arenas. So all of this implies that aesthetic appeal can be subjected to rational analysis and criticism. We cannot trust our sensibilities blindly. They need to be subjected to a critique that queries their historical pertinence. For instance, I hope, or I believe I can demonstrate by rational argument that a classical or modernist or minimalist sensibility is impairing the contemporary subject's capacity to fully participate in the most advanced, vital and productive of today's, today's life processes. The question has to be posed. In terms of the study sensibilities, we all rely on do we have the right sensibilities. And so, aesthetic values that's the third thesis in this kind of little uh, paper encapsulate condensed collective experiences with useful dogmas. Their inherent inertia implies that they progress via revolution rather than evolution. <coughs> so, we rely on them and we move with them until we hit the kind of point of crisis. We, we kind of forced to change them and relearn them. And sometimes a whole culture is forced to relearn its aesthetic sensibilities and sometimes a function system, a discourse like architecture, had to be revolutionized. And architecture and the modernism, the crisis of modernism was one of such moments and people like um, Wolf, in fact, are one of the great revolutionizers of aesthetic sensibilities. And they really had to uh, uh, you have to relearn. I mean, it's, at the same time, you have to kind of, uh, it's a bit like the move from uh, these slick, uh, we call it um, science fiction movies of the, of the late 60s, moving to a kind of Blade Runner sensibility. That's, I think, in parallel to what Wolf was doing. Uh, we had to suddenly develop a lust for contradiction, complexity. Um, um, and intensification of, of, of perhaps messy communicative interactions rather than design that kind of the clean, separated out, orderly, and sanitized. So aesthetic values must be revolutionized if societal conditions or technological opportunities change. You might also just miss out on technological opportunities if you have the wrong sensibilities. You still love these kind of systems symmetries and proportional system based on heavy stone structures. Then you lose out on opportunities. Uh, clients vote with their commissions. Users vote with their feet. And you simply, price of models you mean simply the audience was just going elsewhere. The formulae, sensibilities, predilections, also methods and categories of discussing art, it was simply bankrupt at that period. Um, so the in-depth rational critique of aesthetic values is a matter of theoretical reflection, often triggered by a crisis, for instance the crisis of historicism after World War I, or the crisis of modernism in the 1970s. 
The in-depth rational creation of aesthetic values cannot take place in the heat of the design process, that's also important, nor in the heat of the ongoing life process. I mean, I reflect on my sensibilities, I work on them, but in the fray of my engagement out there, I'm going to rely on my gut reactions and sensibilities. And I can't do it any other way. I can't kind of wait before I post something and have a ponderous theoretical reflection upon it. That in the design process is the same. I can't kind of open up the question of which style to work with, which aesthetic values are historically pertinent each each kind of step in my design process or with each new project I'm engaging. There's a moment of reflection. I might even somebody, the division of labor, some reflect, others, you know, fall in love with the style, you know, you know gain the sense that there's a, this intuition can be trusted and then you just work on it. These become productive dogmas. And I'm saying that styles move from, um, become uh, canonized into useful productive dogmas and finally uh, in the end end up as, as degenerate dogmas and need to be revolutionized. So argument and analysis can only confirm a general operational program for the application of the code values of the beautiful and ugly. These programs are familiar to us. They are the styles to which we are committed, to which we must be at any time committed, as potent designers, discriminating clients, and productive users. All of these they buy in and have their aesthetic values. Um, both aesthetic values and styles within which they are, are canonized are necessary communication structures of a vital um, Theory is only meaningful if it becomes an active force. And that's the difference. That's, that's why I say this theory is launches itself within the old process of architecture. It, it starts descriptive and becomes normative. It becomes to certain extent proselytizing even, a manifesto, because I'm an architect who is defending what I'm doing and I want to bring the force of all you behind the project actually. And, but, but this is not something I'm, I'm inventing like a kind of uh, invented utopia. It's based on a long-term observation and the fact that there is already a convergence. And I don't think any uh, theory or proposal can succeed if it isn't deeply rooted in an already ongoing tendencies. I mean, that's what you also learn from Marx. It's, or the phrase, you have to be on the right side of history. You have to kind of, what you can do, if, if anything, if you want to be an active agent, you got to, you can only, you should participate in something which is already rolling ahead to a certain extent. And it needs to maybe some guidance, some acceleration, some shifting of its force, but you can't kind of step away and negate everything. So I think it's always 95% description and 5%, to have a, five, a level for the 5% contribution forward, this forward drive. So it is, yes, it must be, at this stage we've achieved, we've, we've, we've built up for over 500 years, a very, very rich, sophisticated, let's say, deeply layered and in architectural intelligence. You can't, in a single lifetime, compete with it and think you can reinvent all its terms. So I think the principle must be, is for me anyway, it's always a kind of, the working approach is always to understand the rational of the real, to, to, to understand what we are achieving and how we are achieving it. And you cannot say what's going on is all crap and even modernism wasn't a mistake. It was for me a stunning achievement of changing the... So, so, and then you move, and then what has happened since is a lot of achievement. Figures like yourself, like Zah, there's all the kind of protagonists of a revolutionary period there was a there were kind of a challenges. There was a kind of proliferation of speculation of options. There's a selection process. Drag is one of the great selectors and innovators, at the, you know, which which turns I think what is largely kind of era of creative destruction with creative potential into for, for me an era which becomes more cumulative and and and, and certain about its trajectory. And that's why I reflect that I've, we've been working for 15. 20 years on, on very, very nearly stable with similar lines, just homing in more and more, burdening and loading up more and more these ideas and concepts. But it's very important that this is, this is kind of um, the dialectic 
you have to you have to react or observe, take position, and then take a bet of joining this train. There's some other trains still running. There's a minimalist train moving. There's some idiotic movements even in Britain, which is there's a kind of this, a kind of uh, the historical architecture society of the RIBA, which going. I mean, there's some absurd things going on. There's REM, who's a kind of great um, agitator and, 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 and figure to, to look at, but I have I've made, I know, I've positioned myself and can argue my direction, which is not my direction, which is the direction of a large, a, a nearly a large part of a generation with a lot of protagonists. So that's, I'm reacting to that, and I think we're on the right side of history with that. Yeah, my question goes, is it based on an analysis of the past and yeah. projecting the possibilities of the future? Or, in other words, is it necessary to build a building or architecture in order to prove this scene? Yes, also, I even believe that. I mean, I, I believe that. You tell it. Your stuff, I mean, let's say, the stuff, you actually, you're proving also your point. With your, let's say, the, the major, large, buildings we're starting to do, large important parts of the city, they're no longer just manifesto projects. They are, they have to, you have to deliver. And we are, I think we have to deliver a number of projects which are high performance, state of the art, the best uh, architecture gift to contemporary society in some of the projects. So we are out of this stage, so that's the kind of move from avant-garde to mainstream. It's not yet mainstream because it's a too small group. Uh, but the projects, the BMW project, I think, the Maxis, the Innsbruck stations and so on, they are, they are, they are high performance projects as far as I'm concerned and can demonstrate. Some of, some of earlier structures like Vitra was just a manifesto project because who cares what a fire station is doing at the, at the provincial factory. Or the Rietfeld house was a manifesto project of its time, nobody cares about single family house at that stage and so on. But I think we've, we, we have to... Uh, uh, I think it's urgently that we it's start to deliver. Huh? Yeah, it's a very defensive argument. I like that argument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the European Central Bank, I mean, it got to, uh, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not a whole state. It's, <laughs> I tell you, it's difficult enough. Uh, but um, the other thing is, you are describing. When you are describing the process of uh, making architecture, uh, and, uh, and you are separate architecture from science, you know that I heard a, a lecture from uh, of, a, of a young scientist. He argued the same way like you do, namely that uh, they don't know where they are going. They are operating on a, a peak of uncertainty. And, so, and they have to decide very quickly in order to get um, a solution which is not the solution. So, yeah. It's interesting. So why are you separating science from um, architecture and architecture from art? What, I, I understand it as a marketing tool, not in a bad sense. No, 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 not in a bad sense, but just to explain the position of an architect. Because yeah, we are going down, and uh, we all know that our profession is uh, surviving in the next 15 years. Well, let me. Start. I mean, the, the yeah. distinction between art, I mean, the distinction between art and architecture, um, or the separation. I just again, it's a, I just think it's an empirical reality, and I'll try to explain that. What I mean, I'm looking at discourses systems of communication. And I just noticed that the art world and the art system is a different group of people with different language, different categories, different values. I've never joined a single art studio critique, nor have we ever had an artist invited to, to, to us. Um, I don't think that um, the agenda and criteria variation of certain 
and you have to look at the peak of the lot of uncertainty, let's say, provocative Damien Hurst pieces, uh, sharing the same discourse, agenda, and criteria of success with the best of contemporary architectural projects. That's just a description, and that's simply a fact, and it wasn't like this. I mean, uh, at the t in the Renaissance, even the Baroque, um, you had uh, Michelangelo was the sculptor, the architect, the painter, uh, the cathedral was a synthesis of these, but art was also something totally different. It has become something very different, and I think that the bifurcation happens actually in the early 20th century. You can observe it at the Bauhaus, with a kind of split and separation and the elimination of the artist from the institution. It's just a fact. That's right. Effect of life. <laughs> I'm just observing that, but also I'm asking if this happened, was it right that it happened? And I also observe things like Zaha violently resisting her work to be classified as art because she wants she wanted to participate in the architectural discourse, would cease paintings to be projects. And I think the criteria of success are totally different. And that's simply a fact, but I can rationalize that by saying that the artist was a quite a different uh, societal function. And it's a, it's a much more open-ended and vague function, but it is, as far as I'm concerned, what the art system does for society, it offers this kind of freewheeling platform of uh, experimental communication for all the other subsystems of society. So the, the mass media use the art system to experiment in new forms of electronic communication, uh, new form of filmic techniques. Designers and architects use the art system, and when you go into the art system, the sex criteria are quite different. You actually have to avoid making any performative claims. You cannot say there's anything pragmatic and useful. You just go in there and use it to experiment with, use those resources to experiment with material techniques, with morphologies, and so on. I think that's what we use the art system, and we use it the more in revolutionary and transitional periods, and there's less in periods of more and more self-certainty about where we're going. That's why in these transitional periods, let's say in the 80s, 90s, or 70s, 80s, it, the, the assimilation of architectural art was happening for, for a while, with figures like Chu Yu. But, but and, and I think I feel it's less and less happening now. Um, um. <clears throat> it struck me while you were reading your first chapter that an alternate title might be uh, People Meet in Architecture, which was, of course, the uh, title of Sejima's recent uh, Architecture Biennale. And it seemed, it seemed like she used that as an opportunity to say that contemporary uh, practice falls into two, two camps, let's say. Um, one, that on one hand, you have practices that are uh, phenomenological, social, and perhaps more or less orthogonal in the form. Uh, and that's what's included, in, what was included in that exhibition. And on the other hand, you have uh, practices which are formal, complex, perhaps semiological, and those were the practices that were excluded from the exhibition. Yeah. Um, and if um, architecture is a spatial frame for communication, if this is a fundamental concern of, of your work and the work that you do in your own practice, how is it that that was overlooked, and I guess the second part is, uh, how is your overlook overworked and not included? And on the other hand, do you actually agree with Sedgman's distinctions? Would you share those? Well, I haven't looked at our distinctions in, in detail, but um, there is, it's obvious that uh, our work is largely misunderstood, and the whole uh, movement which I'm calling parametricism is misunderstood in its potential and to a large extent is misunderstanding itself still. So, so I'm kind of uh, burdening this movement with the full responsibility of taking on the next stage of the civilization in terms of built environment and the designs. And that means, um, uh, but I also recognize that the, first of all, the avant-garde is an important subsystem where you have to insulate yourself temporarily from the full burden of delivering and you need to isolate, you need to build up your expertise and repertoire, this means also your former repertoire. You have to take on the new digital design media and <coughs> learn to operate with them and you instinctively knew that there would be a potential in there. And that takes a lot of 
pulling away from the instant delivery of complex performances into a formal project, into a computational processes project. Uh, then you start building up slowly uh, the tectonic elements, tessellation, aperture, structure, but you still, and you, you started to look at what this might, how we might use these single surfaces and so on for organizing social programs, but very, very slowly, still with a very, very heavy focus on the expansion of the formal repertoire. And that looked at impatiently from the outset from other parts of the avant-garde is dismissed as irrelevant, formal ranking, irresponsible rejection of, 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 of the tasks of architecture. And partly this is true because the self-consciousness of those the best and most versatile productive formalist and formal repertoire developers they need to nearly have that consciousness. They need to be free of that burden, to fully indulge and proliferate and be productive. And then there needs to be those who select this and understand that then that needs to be brought back into 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 more into more um, 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 uh, fuller discourse. And that's what I see that was my role, even in the early parts of the DRL. I've seen what Greg has been doing, what uh, uh, what Jeff has been doing before I took over to the DRL there, which. Uh, and that this is great, there's a lot of potential. And this is contemporary, that what contemporary spatial scenarios the city should be feeling and looking like to be high performance in terms of what I call post forest network society. And so I start to burdening this with particular interesting programs like for instance corporate organization and the most contemporary uh, let's say um, network organizations with uh, uh, complex multi-layered euro landscapes, but this was already high performance programs. So really, but but the movement itself was still a lot of self-absorbed. It's just nearly the same with science in the early stages. They're focusing on the mathematics, on developing the apparatus. They can't yet model the real reality. Any economic theory in the initial stages is very abstract and self-absorbed in the kind of elaboration of its conceptual structures. Any prediction is you know, failing and so on. So that's to be expected, but we have to see the long perspective. So, so I believe that um, if you have an um, interest in the sociological structures, which are those which are the most advanced and contemporary, most productive parts of uh, society, you need to precisely look at parameters, and that's where we can, out of this, we can deliver these. And so I think that there are, at the same time there are those people um, who are working on understanding, analyzing what are the contemporary social processes, what are the processes of organization, what, is, what you know, making a lot of analytic observant uh, uh, about what happens in contemporary cities, the multicultural city, the kind of uh, um, migrant patterns on the social, uh, building up a kind of description of the tasks building up an analysis of the social processes which are relevant, which architecture will have to deal with. And, and these are two, and this division of labor and these two strands of investigation is also necessary because you can't do them both at the same time. And they need to be independently developed. So you need to develop a kind of sensibility and understanding of the programmatic functional layer, and you need to develop a kind of sophisticated uh, repertoire building on the, on the formal level, the spatial ordering repertoire, but in the end they need to, need to be brought together and that's why I, my concept of style has this kind of uh, insistence on a functional heuristics and the formal heuristics of parameticism. So the functional, yeah? I'm just curious, I, I have no agenda in asking you this, I'm yeah. just curious what you do with I would argue the most successful architect of the 20th century, which isn't Korb. I mean, Korb is successful to architects, but frankly, Wright was successful culturally. But Wright also, I mean, I've never liked Wright, and I've also liked Wright because he was everything. I mean, he was like Huffman, mm -hmm. and then he was modern, and then he went, you know, stone and, you know, masonry. and. He seems to be somebody that hit this, I don't know, if auto-poetic 
synchronicity with culture is right, that he absolutely nailed the cultural moment over and over again, but then always wrecked it and went some other direction and, you know, wrecked everything, like wrecked his office, wrecked his life, wrecked clients, you know, total destroyer, but also uh, cultural, you know, um, you know, geometer, not like, you know, sensitive. So what do you do with right? Also very kind of parametric of all the modernists in terms of writing codes and languages and, and not pattern books, but in a certain way, very systematic in each step of his work. I'm just wondering, are you interested, repulsed? No, 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 I'm not. Well, I am, I am, I'm interested, and I think he's, he's one of the great protagonists of the evolution of modernism, right. and a great influence, and he kind of predates some of the, his kind of, let's say, one of the key moments of modernism is the move from edifice to space. It was helped by abstract art, but right, the breaking the hermetic volume and shifting plates and cantilevering roofs and the free plan was pre, there was a premonition and was jumped on by the style and, and was elaborated and became part, he then was a part of that. And I think he also uh, is one of those, uh, maybe not the, the most uh, intense and sophisticated, but he also was an architectural writer. He, you can see his fertility also, he was Although these are villas and not the final testing ground, therefore, of what contemporary architecture had to deliver. So these are villas, 20th century villas are all manifesto projects, promises of a new repertoire. So they in themselves, uh, but although they also do something for, for, they do something as well. I mean, the, the private parties and the elite communication in such environments is not to be dismissed altogether, but he did broad acre city. And, and, and that was a kind of very powerful, um, I think, move. So yes, he's definitely a figure, but you're right, he's quite interesting. It's a bit like Rem, I, I don't know, uh, you know, there's a certain psychology of an iconoclast and a kind of nervous and always on the move figure who wants to, who is kind of contributing, is absorbed, picked up, and then he wants to move elsewhere. He's a kind of lifelong innovator and thriving also on otherness and distinction from everybody else. Uh, and I feel the same in REM, which to a certain extent is productive, but to a certain extent also then prevents, uh, uh, you know, he's missing out on, on really enjoying the cumulative trajectory. But somebody like that is more, instead of providing a social function, I mean, those two are more sociopathic. <laughs> I mean, I've always found REM to be a total sociopath as an architect. <laughs> Hates society. Well, well, I think um, I think maybe Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright is also fantastic uh, factories and office buildings. So he was he was he did Brodega City. So he was in there. But I think he also is trying to escape a lot of times. Um, somebody like Le Corbusier is much more strategic. He has the, the big vision and the big impact. I feel. And somebody like Rem, I think I think you find it self limiting that he. He wants to reinvent himself one too many times. And I believe more with me that he can invent a new architecture every Monday morning and he should stick with the project which is worthwhile and pursue it further. So I think with the articles like Bigness and with the Bibliothèque Nationale and the GC Libraries, he was much closer to what we're doing. He was on target and on, 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 on message. And then I think recently he was, he was escaped from this and wants to go back to collage, to, to boxes, to generic. So I think it's, I, it's curious. I don't understand why he doesn't get it, what we're trying to do. Um, and I think there is this kind of, yeah, this kind of slightly psychotic attempt to be always under, always uh, out of step. And, and, but I think his great contribution is what is the retroactive manifestos, which he's done a number of times. It's deliriously not with the discovery of uh, Atlanta, with the discovery of uh, Chinese urbanization, uh, with a look at the periphery, the big fat ugly volumes, shopping. So he's been going out and looked at what happens despite uh, the canon, the predilections, the aesthetic sensibilities of established architecture, and forced us to 
to, to look at this, love it, conceptualize it, systematize and take it on and incorporate it. Uh, he went to Portman. I mean, he's discovered a lot of um, important, because um, that's always this dialectic. I think uh, a certain extent I was saying the, the architectural discourse is in charge and during modernism and hopefully in the future there is, you know, um, everything feeds into and out of this discourse. Every single design of every environment in this world has to go through the needle's eye of this discourse. And if you lead this discourse, you lead this production, but there's of course a lot of mavericks and the, the mutation and, and, and experimentation goes on, not only in architecture, but also outside architecture, where developers and mavericks and, and people just ignore and just do the pragmatic move. And sometimes they hit on something, and Brem was great discovering these things, like, like or Las Vegas was another one of those. With Venturi, these were these are the kind of an alertness to what happens in the built environment outside of the radar of the of, of the discipline, which should in theory be leading. And in the crisis of modernism, in this period, these manifestos coming out in the 70s, uh, you had to look elsewhere because what the discipline was doing was bankrupt, and vital things which were still going on were going on despite of. Uh, the discourse. And I think that, that was Rem's great functions and Venturi's great function. But I would say, criti critically, yeah. what you're excluding from your discourse is building. What you're including is anything that's architecture. But I honestly believe that your argument would exclude certain architects from the autopoetic project. I mean, is there anyone you would exclude? Like, I would think you would exclude Rand. No, 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 absolutely not. No. Really? No, no, I, well, because Rem is, um, no, these are key texts he's been delivering. He's been responding to polemically. He's a central note in the discourse. He's been coming to the A every two years. He's and teaching them. I mean, but and by his force of will or by his resonance? By, his, by what he lives and breathes, what he, what, is, what, he seeks, what he thinks his audience is, what he wants to contribute to. He's been teaching the discipline yeah. about Portman. He said, look at this stuff. Look at, uh, 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 you know, I think he's very, very central. I wouldn't exclude him. I mean, where, where what is less central is commercial mainstream architects. You know, I make this distinction between avant-garde and the mainstream. But I can't exclude mainstream because the mainstream is is, is also, you know, some uh, you take KPF or any, uh, let's say, uh, and uh, you're not talking about vernacular. The vernacular, which happens outside, out there in India, is still traditional buildings outside. But any architecture, whether it's a commercial form, Whatever they are able to do is on the back of an evolved discipline. Maybe it's not the latest stages. Maybe it's you know they're always 10, 15 years behind. But they are participating and they are delivering something which the discourse has worked up as a way of operating. And to a certain extent, they're also picking up continuously from the avant-garde. So as you look at now what KPF is doing, what SOM is doing how versatile their ability, the repertoire has become in terms of using more complex geometries to, to, to adapt to more complex sites. Uh, I'm not even against that. It's, it's, you can criticize it. It's, it's not uh, driven and pure in terms of, for instance, the, the, the theoretical agendas we would promote, but they are, they are, they are still participating. And um, so I wouldn't I would only, only exclude the vernacular, I exclude all vernacular, but all, all um, uh, professional architects are included somehow. As long as they have a discourse. Like even Michael Graves, John Hayden. Yeah, I think, uh, I wouldn't accept uh, they are They're included, they're sure included. So um, I'm saying it's a contested field, what is architecture? It's, it's not a settled uh, issue. I, I see a convergence and I, and I want more forced to be brought behind this movement because I think we're still far away of really transforming 
what happens out there, because what happens out there is still largely modernist, neoclassicist, postmodernist, minimalist, and very little parenthesis. So we need to, and the, and the, and the two years of recession have, was a, was a setback, and nearly people have been kind of saying this, this was a misguided era. I mean, some of the Dubai stuff was misguided in many ways. But uh, there's, a, there's really a danger that um, um, uh, this project gets kind of stunted and the, 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 support, the institutional support has been withering away with Colombia going elsewhere, with, with uh, even the A to a certain extent having us still there, DR and some other units, but less so. So I do, I do feel that um, there's a need to kind of um, um, foster, promote, and, and, and inject new energies into this, into this movement. But the autopersonal is always the totality of the discourse, which includes uh, even, you know, uh, the postmodernists, includes even Roger Scruton, or anybody who's entering the debate with a voice who puts up a show at the RBA. And, and I'm in, in debates with these, some of these characters. So, and the students are exposed to the, the I mean, that's all part of the autopersonal architecture. Uh, but I believe that one strand of this is kind of uh, the right side of history and I've been perceiving this co convergence and I still believe that it will more and more draw, I, mean, I think the younger generation of young architects work and will find intuitively that this is what they should be working on and participating in to be relevant in the next 20 years. I hope there's a sense, I don't know if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong here. Very good question. I mean, certainly, um, I'm, my theory is, by the way, not uh, based on Marxism. It's based on social system theory, which comes out of the tradition of um, complexity theory brought into sociology. Um, but it is, uh, it has many similarities to the Marxist approach in terms of a deep, comprehensive, historical approach to explaining um, even society. Even but, but I, no, the point is this, I mean, uh, the difference here is that in Marxism, the economy dominates society, and in, in, my, in, the, in the social system theory, the economy is just one of the co-evolving subsystems, and yes, contemporary economy is capitalist economy, it's a market economy, that's actually the moment when the autopoiesis of the economy is the emergence of the market economy. is That's when economic issues are isolating themselves from political issues, from issues of power, and through uh, the money economy, with a specialist medium of money, it, there's a self-referentially closed substance of society, which has been evolving through various stages of capitalism, and some of the stages have been initially mercantilism, then uh, laissez-faire capitalism, then imperialism, and social welfare state, uh, so mixed economy. You don't consider capitalism as a despotic system? No, no, no. I, I, exactly not. I believe that, well, I've made this choice. Uh, if I would think that we're living in a despotic system uh, where the bottleneck and the problem is politics or we would require the revolution to overthrow the system, then I wouldn't be an architect, right? So, so I realized that 
I have pr made practically in the last 25 years, obviously I have, the decision to work within contemporary world society. I don't think it needs radical overthrow. I think you can make architecture a contemporary society. And one of the tasks of architecture is to observe and evolve and deliver to a society which has an evolving economic system. And one of the great transformations from a kind of Fordist economic reproduction model to a post-Fordist economic reproduction model is something where the architectural discourse and discipline has to adapt itself to society and also to the economy. So I have I've made peace that I say, uh, you know, the market economy, the political system emerges as a self-referential closed subsystem through ultimately a democratic system. The democracy is the, the contemporary state of the art form. Post for this form of capitalism is the state of the art form. And so so I, I'm fully, I'm fully um, 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 buying into this. I'm, I'm not uh, an anti-capitalist. So what about uh, Foucault's concept of, you talk about discourses, so, uh, and Foucault showed very well that, that uh, uh, how power and how power relations are very well assimilated <coughs> within this order. So it would seem to break it all these issues out in order to... Well, well I, I, I believe in the, to a certain extent, in the rational of the real. I believe that that there are um, what happened, the collapse of communism, the um, uh, globalization, um, these processes which we've been observing over the last 30 years coincide with an enormous increase in the global level of productivity, right? And uh, technological innovations, new levels of freedom and, and communications, the internet, they, you know, they, they exist within a market economy, within a capitalist environment, within parliamentary democracies, within, so, so I don't, I think it's an abstract, I reject this kind of abstract utopian stance of radical critique. I'm not blaming for Crawford because in the, 19s, in the 1960s things were less clear there was, seems to be the, you know, the potential for global world revolution and the establishment of a different order and so on. But I think at 2010, that stands as kind of the uh, wrong side of history. History gone <coughs> elsewhere, and I want to be on the right side of history and go with it. But that will be volume two, <coughs> Architecture and Politics. I have my, my, my position clearly. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, surprising that you say that at the moment things seem to be very clear when the whole of North Africa is uh, totally unclear about what is going to happen and a lot of systems that for some time gave stability to, let's say, to our welfare because they took care of most of the oil that exists in this world. Now is in a state of turmoil. Nobody, I guess, not even analysts in the banks in in, in Watts would know what is going to happen. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised how you think that things are so stable and everybody knows what the course, what the course of society is. And the other thing is, uh, even if productivity was, uh, I mean, is at levels as it has never been before, it might also be so that the productivity is so efficient that we kill the planet. I mean, and, and if you only argue on this technological level, I think you are, I think, bound in a kind of tool discussion on what we have as tools, but you don't really discuss the answer. No, 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 I, I, I think it's important what you say. Let's say, also, in with respect to the relationship of system theory to Marxism, the deep grounding of or the more prof most profound category for me is the category of productivity. But it's not just material output per time unit. It incorporates something less easy to measure, which is working conditions and per output unit, and also the ecological burdening which is produced by also these externalities have to be cut, you know, they're, they're folded into a more 
enhanced and sophisticated concept of productivity. So, and I, I, so that's that's important. And, um, you know, the sustainability discourse and social sustainability is folded in there. But if I look at what happens in the and what has been called the Arab Revolution or the Arab Awakening, I don't see radical different models appearing. I see that just a kind of catching up of uh, parts of the developing world with the most advanced models. They call it, whether they manage to achieve it, whether they have an understanding of all the conditions which need to be placed to establish a sophisticated rule of law, multi-party democracy uh, with institutional guarantees and process. That I don't know, but the model they're looking for is just the catching up. Uh, you know, overcoming anachronistic, seemingly anachronistic regimes. And I think the same will happen in China. And there's no different political system on view, and there's no different economic system on view. What they would like to see is parliamentary democracy with, 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 the, with the more <coughs> properly instituted um, uh, market processes where competition is fair, where uh, you know, um, um, institutional processes are more convergent. And, uh, yeah, so that's, I think you can compare to a certain extent, let's say, the, um, the marketization of the economy, the democratization of politics, the legal system turned from a kind of rule of God to rule of nature into positivist understanding of the legal process, continuous innovation. All of these systems are about continuously making continuously adaptive these systems and in terms of architectural equivalent to that, these are modern, uh, modern achievements, is the spatialization of architecture, edifice of space. But I think each of these systems evolves a kind of global best practice. We are in an era where all these systems are world systems, world science, world architecture design, world economy, world politics more and more. You can see what happens in Libya is that there's, there's no sense of a kind of sovereign country <coughs> with eternal affairs. There's a global court in the Hague. So we, we treat, this becoming a world political system and there are, let's say, I would argue, global best practices of how to set up a well-functioning financial system. How to set up the ingredients of a proper political system, ingredients of a proper economic system, proper state of the art science with the, with the, with the, with the upgraded methodology and epistemology. And I say in architecture design the same. I think parametricism, in a sense, I would argue, is, is or would be that state of the art um, um, uh, best practice. I propose, which is equivalent of a certain type of um, sophisticated uh, multi-party democracy. So it's basically a scaleless operation, which would mean that it can be used for designing a building, a city, or a political system? Uh, no, no. Uh, I no, mean... No, uh, no. Uh, well, political system, that's... Uh, Autopedic the political system is for politicians. It's its own autopedically enclosed discourse. We can only observe, adapt to, on our yeah, own I mean, terms to that. But yeah. yes, across scales, I would believe from parametrism argues that it, 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 interiors, buildings, urban quarters, whole cities, um, even um, all designed design elements. You can see the same principles, I would argue, the same rejection of uh, simple uh, geometric primitives like circles, squares, triangles. They, they have disappeared out of the design world, they have disappeared out of uh, um, um, architecture, they have disappeared out of urbanism. And that's why I think sometimes Rembrandt like, well, wants to do a city in the shape of a square. Um, but yes, I think there is, these principles are um, universal, but at the same time they're very open. They have offered degrees of freedom unheard of, and they have internal richness and multi-trajectories, but in a direction. Yes, I think it's, uh, this, to this extent, it's scaleless. So how could it be specific? Oh, it's one of its premises, be specific. Uh, be contextually sensitive. Be sensitive with respect to 
the internal operations. It is, it is able to, to pick up project programs and briefs which have degrees of novelty which are unheard of. You cannot start with a brief which is just a list of five stereotypical sch schedule of accommodation with five stereotypical types of spaces. You need to unravel programs in terms of parametrically um, um, differentiated event scenarios with, with multiple audiences and multiple event parameters. That's the way you, you know, dynamical system, crowd um, simulations, that's the way you work on program. So that's why I'm saying there's a particular functionalistic, a particular way our style is picking up, interpreting and handling in briefs, which is different from the modernists, which were different from the classicists. And that matches the way we kind of bring in a formal repertoire to this. These principles, in a sense, you would never, they're, also, they're very abstract, but I don't think anybody, anybody of us would want to violate them, would step back behind them. You know, you can no longer go back. It's like you can no longer go back to old men with dyed hair as, you know, uh, presidents which are, which are elected with 95% of votes. You know, this, on that same level, uh, I would argue, this is kind of a, the most sophisticated best practice uh, which, which, which this discourse has evolved and that's the kind of struggle of debates the, uh, the struggle of ideas we are engaging in. But isn't that also a bit colonial? That if you say that now what, the, what happens in the Arab world is just uh, catching up to where we are? Well, that's what they, they, they admit to that. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's what they want. I mean, what, who are we to exclude them? I mean, um, and, and I, I... But there might be something different. That's what I don't believe. I believe that this is a... Com uh, whatever is uh, this kind of, let's say, moving, evolving thing, which I've just hinted at as a kind of co contemporary best practice, is continuously worked on and competitively refined, where Europe and the different countries within it compete with America, compete with Japan, China is still picking up and learning and introducing. But they are owning and, the US? Hmm? Yeah. At the moment, they own the US already to a big part. I mean, they're not catching no, up. No, but in terms of institutional structures, there's, they, they actually have a conscious project of, they know they have to introduce democracy sooner or later. To, to, to remain viable and, and progressive, and they have such ideas and programs. And I think, but there's also there's enough um, competing regions. It's also cities, municipal government structures. How do you manage, uh, you know, urban planning and, and, and uh, incentives? How do you manage tax system? How do you manage? How do you upgrade legal systems? Uh, how do you uh, develop economic frames? How do you develop your built environment? That's what all these centers and hothouses compete for and compete around. And I think that's what we should observe. I don't. I think we should consciously look for the most advanced uh, centers of productivity around the world. I mean, that's why I was so keen to to win the kind of competition for Google Campus uh, in San Francisco. I mean, this this is the kind of thing where you can whatever. Uh, you manage to make, allow them to make the next stage of social communication, of, of uh, high productivity environments and so on, that would that become a model, that would become a kind of a, a aspect of the state of the art. Um, I do, do believe it's a world system and anything we design now, it's, it's, it's on the internet, uh, the next day everybody's looking at it and everybody can contribute. If I pick up something, uh, somebody in India does and throws it off the internet, it gathers a kind of momentum behind it. I need to adapt my relevancy and learn from it. That's why these things are more than ever world discourses. The same as the scientific papers which are circulating. I think it's a kind of competitive, um, but I don't think there are, there are uh, there's no meaning in insisting on a kind of, uh, well, there are slogans like this Chinese solution. There is no Chinese solution. Uh, you know, they, could, they could attain levels. Efficiency in terms of economy without introducing what the West had always hoped would happen soon, democracy. They have a different combination of practices that we were pretty surprised that this was possible. 
I don't think so. I mean, the growth rates which China is achieving at the moment, that, that's easy. Because all that they need to do is to bring vast numbers of their population which are still employed far less productive, with less capital, with less equipment, up to par. If you, you know, they just import technology, they import all the management structures, import everything and put their people, which are really well educated, import education, send people work, and they just, they just can kind of buy in and put the work, more and more of their people, state of the art. That's why they can grow 10%. Once all of them are more or less operating, to the fullest level of contemporary world technological equipment and processes, then they will have to prove how to grow further. You know, where is the next level of innovation? That's of course much slower. That's very, very easy. And they will, their growth rate will kind of flatten out. And then they will realize that they, how inefficient and corrupt their administrative processes are. That economic decisions uh, are overburdened by you know political networks and so on. And all countries are operating. They will run into this issue that the, 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 the leadership decisions are simply bad decisions because information processing isn't involving enough bottom-up uh, uh, information. Is, is irrational. Isn't isn't discursively vetted and checked. They will certainly uh, uh, um, um, fall no, fall behind if they don't keep reforming. And, but I don't think it needs to be thought of as a Western system anymore. This is, you know, Japan is there, and all these cultures have at various stages in the history fed into this, and I always find it kind of problematic uh, with these kind of regions which are still ultra-nationalist, like China, which reminds me of what Germany was in the 1930s, that they are kind of blockheading themselves and, um, and, and stopping themselves. They want this kind of insistence on Chinese is, is, is really a schizophrenia. Because you know that in Japan, I mean, it was from starting from the Meiji period, this was the major cultural struggle, what means the Western world, how do we keep the Japanese culture? And I think the story of late 19th century and 20th century architecture up to Kangi was nothing else, but uh, what is Japanese and what is not. And Steve Suzaki wrote a book, I think, four years ago, that is talking about the Japanese-ness of Japanese architecture. So, I mean, these people perceive that some of the systems they live in are European or Western. That's it is a, not that's so a pity. that they simply assimilate it without any resistance. That's a pity. Uh, just a question. I think that even stronger than all the political systems is actually the capitalistic system itself, because this, that's the system everyone wants to have and everyone is heading after. And I'm questioning if the capitalistic system is not is a system that is more eating up the architecture as a discursive, you know, media than supporting it. Um, well, I'm not sure what you're alluding to, but I mean, um, uh, yes, let's say uh, some of the um, um, resources which have been flowing to parts of the avant-garde have been um, motivated by, let's say, concerns of, of iconography, advertising. I'm not sure we're doing to this, a kind of a, a sense for this superficial construction of an entity. There's been this discourse of uh, criticizing star architecture being delivery of superficial meaningless icons and so on. I'm not sure if you're alluding to that uh, aspect of a kind of commercialization of architecture, even of avant-garde architecture. Sometimes there's this kind of argument, and my response to this would be twofold. On the one hand, I would say that... Maybe uh, it's about who is ruling the discourse. Um, oh, well, not, certainly not business people. It's people like Greg and Wolf and... Uh, yeah, uh, in what kind of frame, you know? There are different kinds of frames. No, I, I do believe, I don't think that the, 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 the discourse of architecture is uh, ruled by economics. I don't believe that. Um, even though you have um, to find a publisher who is forced to make money on the, on the book, 
or as a firm you have to reproduce yourself in an economy through fees. That's not, um, that's just a constraint. It doesn't tell you what to do and how to do it. You just, and, and, so that remains this kind of autonomy and, 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 and um, I don't see that. I, uh, but what we have to watch out and what, what we should be watching out is for uh, truly productive and flourishing phenomena which happen outside of architecture in what you might call the commercial world, like the, like the career of port, like Portland or like the kind of uh, flourishing of the periphery, uh, ugly, deep monster buildings. This was a, you know, that's what we have to, that's where the, if the, we have to watch out, where is the vitality of society and the economy going, and we have to take this up and make this our project. I do believe this. I don't think we, our independence is only autonomous, how to adapt on which terms in the most sophisticated and layered way. Not we do something else. We as architects decide we want our society to, 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 to go elsewhere and we want to force another kind of building down the throat of society because it's more pure, more beautiful. Uh, that's not my world. My world is surfing the wave skillfully with alertness uh, and, and intricate knowledge of the wave. And, um, uh, but on, on, on my terms, you know, and, and the wave is a constraint of force. I'm surfing, and it doesn't tell me how to surf. <laughs> so we do leave it like this? Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.